everybody. Uh, very good evening and uh, warm greetings from Bengaluru. I would like to invite all the participants for the webinar on the on COVID-19 vaccines, the much uh, awaited uh, talk because there's a lot of queries that we have on vaccines as it is because um, every month we hear on the variants of concern, the changing in the strains of the variants, especially with uh, in relation to COVID-19. And uh, we as students, when we were studying about HIV virus, this was taught to us telling that HIV is so uh, you know, uh, clever as a retrovirus. Every time um, an antibody is formed against this particular virus, the virus changes its antigenic antigenicity on its um, surface. That is, every time a key is found, the lock changes. So the key is no more effective against the virus. I think that we are coming across now in this pandemic with respect to the COVID-19 virus. There's a lot of um, variants that we've seen in the last one year. And at least in the past three to four months, we have again come across um, a new strain that's called the Delta variant. And recently, uh, two days back when there was a talk from the ICMR and NCTC, the director there referred about the Delta variant strain, Delta plus variant, which is, uh, which was, uh, which is, uh, I think only seven strains have come out out of the 28,000 uh, sequences that they've done. And they say that this particular variant, that Delta Place variant, which is which has a, a AY1 uh, strain and uh, which has a mutation in the K417N is found to be a new strain, which uh, is actually uh, the, the concern here is because not much of the um, uh, I mean, spread is seen in this particular strain, but the concern in this particular strain is if this spreads, then the monoclonal therapy would be at stake. So two, we have two eminent speakers today who will be completely talking about the vaccines, the immunogenicity of the vaccine, the efficacy, and of course, if there is a variant of concern, are these uh, vaccines going to be effective against the variants of concern? We have, uh, in the beginning, we have Dr. Swati Shukla, who will be delivering her speak, and then we will be followed by Dr. Vivek Nayak. Now, uh, I would like to uh, say a few words about our speakers. Dr. Swati Shukla has done her PhD in immunology from Hanover School of Medicine. She's worked on cystic fibrosis and clotting disorders during her post job at Lunds University, Sweden. At present, he's work, she's working in Bangalore and she will be delivering a lecture on uh, vaccines, the immune response of the very different vaccines that we have in COVID-19 uh, issue. So Swati, it's over to you. You can start your lecture. Okay. Uh, hi. Hello. Uh, yeah. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, uh, KCVT team, for giving me this opportunity to talk about uh, uh, immune system and now the much talked about uh, topic of vaccines and uh, variants of concern. Um, am, am I audible? Yes, yes, Swati, you are audible. Okay. Uh, okay. Um, okay, so before we go to the vaccine part, I thought it's uh, necessary to jog our memory about, uh, because vaccines are a product of the immune response or the immunity that uh, is provided. So I thought it's uh, important to first learn about the immunity part before we go to the vaccine. It might be a little repetitive for a lot of people. And uh, I mean, I'm sure all of you are already aware of the immunity part, uh, but I just want to focus on some parts of that so as to know where the COVID uh, uh, SARS-CoV-2 virus 
where it affects and where does the vaccine jump in to help in controlling and providing protection. Um, okay. So to begin with, so immune system can be broadly divided into innate immune system and adaptive immune system. Innate immune system is what we know innate, which is already there and something that doesn't need uh, a specific uh, mounting of immune response. So these can be to begin with our skin, which are the physical barriers, skin, mucous membrane, uh, the acid in the gut. These are the ones which are the first line of defense. So innate system is the first line of defense and protect us from majority of pathogens. It is when this first line of defense is broken, then the adaptive immune system kicks in. So uh, there are a lot of cells which are part of this innate immune system, as you can see in the picture. Um, so these are uh, uh, natural killer cells, monocytes, basophils, neutrophils, mast cells, macrophages, and a set of proteins called complement protein. And uh, other than this, there are a lot of uh, chemical soluble factors which are also part of this innate immune system. So uh, what we see in COVID, uh, also I'll come, this, come to this later and I'm sure uh, all of you doctors have seen it live that how the immune innate immune system goes into overdrive and it and it's the hyperinflammation that is caused due to the innate immune system is that we see the severe uh, outcome in covid patients so when we come to adaptive immune system so adaptive immune system is when uh, a body body or the immune system needs antigen to see the antigen and then act towards it. So in a way, innate immune system, there are a lot of cells in innate immune system, which also primes the adaptive immune system. For example, the dendritic cell. Uh, many times, dendritic cells also act as antigen presenting cells. So these cells also present to adaptive immune system, so which is the T cell and B cells. And this leads to the activation of T cell and B cells. And then these cells, so B cells, as we all know, produce uh, antibodies. And antibodies are important in countering the pathogen. And T cell, which can be divided further into uh, CD8, CD8 T cells, and CD4 T cells. CD4 T cells are the helper T cells. They also act as antigen presenting cells. These cells also release cytokines. They also help other cells. They also act as antigen presenting cells to B cells. So B cells then after seeing the cells from T helper cells, it also produces antibodies. And it also activates the CD8 T cells, which then can get converted to cytotoxic T cells. And these cells then directly kill the uh, cells which is affected by the virus. Uh, so this, uh, oh, oh, okay. So coming back again to innate and adaptive immunity, these two arms of immune systems, how important they are in controlling any disease. And it is the, and especially for a disease like COVID, whatever research has been conducted so far, we can see that there's a, there's not a coordinated response of these two arms of immune system, which has led to the severe outcome that we see in uh, some COVID patient, not all. So in patients that we, which are, so people who are asymptomatic or moderate, there we see that immune system is able to handle. So for example, innate immune system, which is triggered within hours to days, helps to control the pathogen for some days and then adaptive immune system kicks in and that produces T cell, B cell, then it takes care of the pathogen. But in the case of uh, uh, COVID-19, it has been found there's a high amount of increase in uh, cytokine markers, as you can also see from the, uh, the infection profile that is done. There is an increase in uh, chemokines, pro-inflammatory cytokines, neutrophils, uh, high, um, uh, dysregulated neutrophils, and uh, dysfunctional monocytes. So these kind of cells which are uh, not able to act as a, so to push adaptive immune system further. So that is what is seen in a lot of patients who suffer with the uh, severe COVID uh, infection. 
um, so somebody was also asking whether it is the humoral immunity or the cell mediated immunity that uh, that plays a big role in uh, covid 19 immunity so i would say it is both uh, we are sometimes fooled with uh, just looking at antibody titers but uh, if you see um, studies that have been done so antibody titer is high in uh, high or moderate level in uh, uh, asymptomatic to severe patient also these are the neutralizing antibodies which are present initially to take care of the antigen uh, but after some time so these this titer might go down after some time which is normal because neutralizing antibodies they have a short duration function they do their job and that is done but then we see that after there are publication which show that antibodies have been found or the long term or moderate to long term immunity has been found up till 6 to 8 months uh, from the first time of the infection and these antibodies that are found in later stage these are formed by b cells memory b cells so there is a humoral part which is from the beginning till the end it it uh, it plays a role in the initial part of the adaptive immunity as well as the later memory response and we also see T cell response, which is cell mediated immunity. We see T cells which kick in after some days of the infection to take care with the helper T cells and cytotoxic T cells, as I mentioned before. And these cells directly kill, uh, kill the infected cells and the virus. So memory B cells, memory T cells, both are also found after six to eight months after infection. So it is both. Uh, so innate and adaptive arms of uh, immune systems are involved in COVID infection. But, and when we talk about the long-term memory, uh, so the antibody produced or the T cells produced in that both B cell and T cell play a big role. Some have short duration role, some have a longer duration role. Uh, I don't know how much of this slide is visible. Um, so here, this is from one publication uh, that came out last month. So here, I just want to point out to some of these. Um, oh. uh, so the picture shows mild to moderate to severe cases what we see in the early phase and then the late phase when the infection or the inflammation is systemic. So you can see, uh, I'll not go in too much detail, but you can see, uh, so the natural killer cells, neutrophils, uh, they are in the pro-inflammatory pro stage and all the markers are upregulated. So this study, they, uh, they did the transcriptome, the expression profiles of different uh, markers that are involved in the early stages of inflammation. And they found that all of those markers were quite high. And uh, uh, CD16 monocytes, dendritic cells are down. So dendritic cells, as I mentioned before, act as antigen presenting cells. So you need these antigen presenting cells to act as a, uh, like a middle person to present this antigen to the B cell. So if there is a low expression of these uh, dendritic cells, that means the antigen presentation is also reduced. That is why see, we see in severe cases, the adaptive immune system kicks in much later or probably does not. Uh, and in the late stages, we see that uh, we still see when the system, it continues to be like that. So there is some kind of dis dysregulation that we see in severe cases. Uh, between the innate and adaptive that leads to the uh, COVID severe outcome that we see. Um, okay. So now when we come to the question of memory, immunological memory. So uh, as I said, immunological memory, what constitutes of immunological memory? Immunological memory is constituted of memory B cell and memory T cells. Uh, memory B cells, 
so immunological memory is for example if if for example i am the b cell and this is the virus that comes if i see this virus one time i will remember the virus and if i see the virus again i'll be producing the response will be faster so similarly with t cells so once they are activated um this pool of memory b cell can generate antibodies faster and the pool of uh, memory t cell can produce the cytotoxic t cell faster which can uh, kill the virus or the virus infected cell faster so this is the one of the latest publication that has come up in science where um so where they check for uh they check for the antibody response the antibodies to the main antigen the main antigen which is the spike protein we know and the receptor binding site of the site protein and the nucleocapsid antigen so these three are the main uh, markers and antibodies are tested for these markers uh so they could see uh you can see here you can see from 1 month to 6 month and up to 8 months they could see the antibodies produced again these three uh proteins and they also found the cd4 positive t cells and cd8 positive t cells antigen specific memory b cells they were present up until 6 to 8 months so this is one of the study uh that show that there is some degree of immunological memory uh, in the individuals who had uh, mild to moderate covid uh, infection so yeah this is the paper so from this paper they say that some degree of protection is provided and uh, they checked for 188 cases where they saw uh, there were different ranges of in infection and the severity so up to 6 months they could see that uh, there is immune response to sars cov2 virus and this is another paper this also came up recently and this is the one that a lot of people are citing to say uh, that um, covid infection provides uh, long term immunity and probably life long immunity this is how the article in nature news it says uh, it might be life long but uh, in the paper they talk with a caveat that this is because we only tested they only found it in 18 individuals and uh, how did they so they could see that there were antibodies against the spike protein and they could also find the plasma cell specific for this uh, that produce this spike protein antibodies in the bone marrow aspirates of these individuals uh this was up 7 to 8 months after infection they could find these antibodies uh so they take that long lived bone marrow plasma cells uh so we know memory cells that are when they are in the body so after the function is done they go and go to different sites and bone marrow is one site of homing where b cells go and settle and whenever there is a need they they are active and they produce the antibodies so uh, in this paper they say that long lived bone marrow plasma cell are a source of constant protective antibodies and the protection is durable uh so this was another study also came i think in march march or april and probably this is the study that was done in pro probably the largest uh, set of population so far so here they they use the pcr because in in denmark uh, getting tested by pcr is free so the hospital had uh, tested these patient who came at different uh, at the uh, sorry the first phase and the second phase of uh, covid infection so through this uh, they collected a lot of data and what they assessed that uh, they could see the individuals who are younger so the younger individuals below 65 years of age uh they had protection up to 80% but the protection protection reduces 
in the individuals who are above 65 and older. So, but they only, they only assessed through PCR. This is only the PCR testing that has been done. Okay, so these are the three studies that at least I saw and that were the most popular and people were citing these as an example that there is a long-term COVID immunity. Okay, uh, can we take the questions later if that is okay? Yeah, questions will keep coming in the chat box, but you can take it later. Moderator will uh, anyway. Okay, 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 okay. So this was I just wanted to give a background of the immunity, different arms of immune system, uh, innate, adaptive, humoral, and cell mediated. Before we jump to the vaccines, and uh, I'm sorry again if all of this feels like a repeat. But I just felt that this was necessary before we talk about vaccine, vaccine efficacy, and long-term protection. So vaccines, so what, what are vaccines? We know that vaccines, at least historically, they have been the weakened, weakened form of pathogen, which is either inactivated or modified in some way so that it does not cause infection, but still is capable of generating an immune response. And... Uh, uh, main example of vaccine is BCG vaccine for uh, tuberculosis, polio vaccine, smallpox vaccine, measles, hepatitis B. These have been quite successful example of vaccine for many, many years. Uh, now coming to COVID-19 vaccines, uh, there are different types of COVID-19 vaccines. Different manufacturers have tried out new things. Some are new and some are uh, the old tested methods. So for example, there is messenger RNA vaccine, which is, uh, so the work on messenger RNA vaccine was being done for probably last 10 years and more. So the technology to produce vaccines through messenger RNA was there. It was only that it was used at such a, so at, at such scale and at such short notice, this was the first time that happened. And second is the DNA vaccine, which we will talk about. So mRNA vaccine use mRNA as the blueprint to be used for vaccine uh, for the immune response. In DNA vaccine, they use DNA to be used for generation of response. And uh, likewise with the protein-based vaccines, it's the protein part, some parts of the virus, which are used as inactivated part of the virus, which is used as vaccine in the protein-based vaccines. Okay, so, so this is the, the structure of uh, SARS-CoV-2 virus. This is the spike protein, the nucleocapsid, and the RNA. So uh, most of the, probably the more, the eminent vaccine manufacturers have used spike protein uh, to be used because uh, it's the, the receptor binding domain that is in the spike protein. Uh, this is where uh, the binding happens with the um, cells in the body. So you can see the spike protein here, and this is the receptor binding domain of spike protein. And uh, it's the, these uh, RBD, receptor binding domain, the spike protein and the nucleocapsid protein. The antibodies against these are the ones that are checked when we ask about, when we check if there are antibodies or immune response against the uh, COVID-19. Uh, okay, so uh, different types of COVID-19 vaccines uh, that are uh, almost in the last phase of trials, and many of them have already started uh, vaccination in last couple of months. So this is Pfizer BioNTech vaccine, Moderna vaccine, or Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine, also the Covishield vaccine in India, Covaxin, Sputnik V, uh, Sinopharm 2, and Sobre, Sobre Nana. Oh, sorry, there's a spelling mistake. Um, <clears throat> okay. So I'll come to each vaccine one by one. 
and talk about the mechanism of action and how the vaccine uh, lead to protection. So very briefly, the mechanism of action of how vaccine work is one thing, um, once the body is primed, the, the spike protein, spike protein or the proteins or the smaller particle, viral particles that are in the body are taken up by antigen presentation cells, uh, which present it to other cells. And then these cells, for example, B cells or uh, T cells. So B cells, once it is presented by the antigen, B cell produces antibodies. What does T cell do? When T cell is presented, it uh, engulfs those, um, um, those antigen or viral particles and it uh, destroys or kills that cell, eliminating the uh, the viral, the virus and the cytotoxic T cells, or it is directly uh, killed by the uh, natural killer cells, for example. So the first vaccine is a messenger RNA based vaccine, which is, uh, these are the ones which are produced in US, the Pfizer and Moderna vaccine. Um, so this is again, as I said, messenger RNA vaccine is the first time that it's been used for large scale production and tested on a population. So what is the Pfizer and Moderna vaccine? It's a modified RNA that is attached to a lipid nanoparticle. So why, as you can see in the picture, this is the RNA. And uh, so lipid is like a fat, fat droplet. So it, it engulfs the RNA so that it is protected. Because uh, as we know, RNA is very notorious. It degrades very fast. And that is also one reason why it needs storage of minus 80 degrees. Um, <clears throat> so, so far, the results that have been shown by Pfizer and Moderna, uh, according to their results, they have 90 to 95% efficacy. So quite a good response they have seen. Uh, based on their, from the studies that have come up. And again, the tighter antibody titers that they have checked up until eight months is quite good response, good uh, antibodies, neutralizing antibodies, uh, plasma cells. So they could see these things. <clears throat> so second, the DNA-based, uh, DNA vector-based vaccines. So DNA-based vaccines, which is the uh, Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine and Sputnik vaccine. So Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine, which is a collaboration of uh, Oxford UK and uh, Swedish company AstraZeneca uh, and Sputnik V, which is from uh, uh, Russian government, I think, Russian Department of Health from Gamalaya Institute in Russia. So both these vaccines use the same model both use modified DNA as the blueprint and both use adenovirus as the delivery agent. So there are a lot of questions that you are putting a DNA in the body, but this DNA has been modified that it doesn't replicate once it's injected in the body. It only goes inside and uh, so yeah, this is the diagram. So this is the DNA and this is the adenovirus. It's taken up by the body. It goes into the nucleus Inside the nucleus, it goes and produces the messenger RNA and this messenger RNA then comes out into the cytoplasm and produces the spike protein. So the role of uh, this uh, adenovirus delivery vector is only the, as acting as a transport agent, the delivery agent. Uh, so an adenovirus is quite common <clears throat> vector that is used in vaccine production. Um, yeah, so the mechanism of action is the same. The, the difference is only in the uh, vaccine and the delivery. The, it, it also does the same thing. It activates antigen presenting cells, T helper cell, B cell, and the virus is neutralized. And the efficacy so far is 90 to 91%. Uh, 
the only difference is that Sputnik uses a different adenoviral vector in the first and second dose. And uh, after some months, Sputnik has also come up with the Sputnik light in which they only give the first dose and that is 76, found to be 76% effective. Uh, because they share so many similarities, they use yeah. the same mechanism and vaccine. So uh, there, are there is talk of collaboration between AstraZeneca and Sputnik to see if there's a possibility to make a better vaccine or something which has uh, better efficacy. <clears throat> One minute. <clears throat> the third type of vaccine is the uh, where they use the old style method where the vaccine is the virus particle, pathogen particle is inactivated and this, uh, and this one is used by Covaxin and Sinopharm. Covaxin is the Indian vaccine, the home, homegrown vaccine. Sinopharm is the Chinese vaccine and they both use the, uh, they both use inactivated virus. Um, so there are, uh, we, we can talk about this later or probably in the questions, the difference between messenger RNA, DNA, and so those are RNA, DNA based vaccine. This is protein based vaccine. Um, so protein based vaccine take a lot of uh, time testing to be produced. So thereby you can see that it's only now that uh, the Indian vaccines have come up, Indian and Chinese vaccine have come up with their uh, clinical trials but they are more sturdy. These vaccines, because it's protein, that doesn't degrade so fast. So that's also the reason it can be kept at uh, two to eight degrees temperature compared to the more fragile DNA RNA vaccine. So, so what are these vaccines? The uh, inactivated vaccine, inactivated virus is the, in this, they use the SARS-CoV-2 virus and they inactivate it by one chemical called uh, propiolactone. And this method of inactivation of virus is very commonly used. It's a common method of virus inactivation, which damages the DNA, but keeps the protein intact. So, which is what we want. We want the spike protein because that's the one which binds to the cell and that is needed. So this is the inactivated virus that you can see. <clears throat> uh, okay. so. So fourth type of vaccine is uh, Soberana vaccine uh, two, which is uh, from Cuba. So the Cuban, there are a lot of pharmaceutical companies in Cuba and they're quite good in their biotech sector. And uh, so they have come up with two vaccines, uh, Soberana two and one more, which is also a similar name is there. So this vaccine also differs from the inactivated virus vaccine because in this, uh, they take only the receptor binding domain of the spike protein and they combine it with the tetanus toxoid. Uh, so this, in this case, the phase three clinical trials just started in March. And uh, so this publication I put, so the results have come and they are quite, uh, it said that they're quite good. But because the <clears throat> Cuba is a small island, it's a very small population, and Cuba did not, uh, because they contained the virus quite well, they did not see a lot of cases. So for them to see um, asymptomatics, uh, asymptomatic moderate and severe cases, and to see over a period of time and with different responses, it was difficult for them. So they have, they gotten it tested in Iran and Mexico also. But so far, a lot of people in Cuba are also being vaccinated. Okay, so this was about the vaccine. Now coming to the third part of the talk, which is the variance of concern. <clears throat> okay, so uh, when we talk about variance, 
so far there have been many variants of covid-19 but uh, not all of them were cause of concern because virus always virus mutates it keeps on mutating it's natural for the virus to mutate it's only when there are a lot of changes in the uh, in the epitope where it is recognized by the antibody and or and which causes either in change in infectivity or transmission or both then it becomes a cause of concern so here i have put up uh, the four variants of concern that have come so far first is the alpha variant or the uk variant b b1.1.7 and uh, which was found in uk second is the south african variant called the beta variant third is the was found in brazil and called the gamma variant and fourth is the delta variant or the indian variant that we saw in the second wave of pandemic in india uh so next is the whether vaccine is effective against these variants or not um so there are couple of studies that have been done even actually when oh i did not mention johnson and johnson vaccine so uh, when johnson and johnson was uh, this was during the period when they were uh, in the development stage of their vaccine uh they were they, so it was tested in south africa and uh, it was tested for different vaccines also so they found the south african variant that it did not elicit that huge response but there were still some antibodies antibodies were produced uh for the with the vaccine that was used at that time so at least in one case we can say that uh, even though it's not as expected as great immune response with the vaccine but there is a but they only check for antibody titer they do not check for the second part which is the they do not they did not check for memory b cell or memory t cell if they check probably for this this section they only check new neutralizing antibodies if they had checked for they would have probably found and this is something that we don't know at the moment um okay so next is uh, mortality morbidity so um so these variants of variants are of concern because we have seen a lot more death and lot more disease severity with these vaccines variants of concern uh but that is also because our health health system was not was not prepared and we can say that for the other countries also the, this was the case in uk south africa brazil and india so one reason that these uh let's say uh, serious variants are also coming because virus is getting more and more chance to pass through lot of people the more it passes through population there is more chance that uh, uh those things are picked up by random selection and we'll see more and more variants that is why it is all the more important that uh, vaccination is done so that we see less and less variants and um, the vaccine results that have been given by these companies and i think all vaccines claim that this is it's only giving protection it's not uh, so <clears throat> it reduces it 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 reduces the severity of infection it reduces hospitalization so these are the things that vaccines are effective so for delta variants for example we cannot say it's too early and uh, we need to collect lot of sample we need to follow up these population who have been affected by uh, mild to moderate to severe and uh, it should be observed over a period of time to see that uh, the infection has generated a uh, reasonable immune response and uh, to see that further vaccines will be effective or not okay uh, so this was from my side um yes okay one minute okay 
Ja. Thank you, Swati. That was a very informative talk. Uh, you dealt with the basics of immune response, but I just had one um, hold on this, that uh, you see that there is memory in this particular uh, condition, but we see a lot of reinfections and reinfections happening within a span of one month. They come back, um, you know, they, they turn out to be positive, then they go for quarantine for 14 days. 14 days later, they come negative, and then in a span of another 15 days, they turn out to be positive again. Of course, we didn't have the facility of sequencing at that time. So we couldn't send the second, and the, um, the first and the second samples for sequencing to see if there was any kind of variation there. But we have seen a lot of reinfections in the healthcare workers itself. So if mm -hmm. memory was formed, then why was there uh, you know, the infection with us in such a short span of time? Okay. Uh, so the infection doesn't... Okay, I don't know how to... First of all, I, I think in this time, there was a lot of questions about the testing also. Many times people were uh, coming out with positive, then negative, and a lot of patients had all the COVID system, were, but were COVID... Uh, negative for the test so i don't know this is also one thing that is at least in this second wave of the pandemic it was not quite clear uh, who do we so these different categories different categories of covid that we had um, so this is first thing that uh, covid positive negative in this at least in second pandemic there were several different parameters that we were using to uh, to evaluate if a person is indeed COVID positive. Are you talking about the second wave or the first wave? Uh, the first wave. The, the first, first wave. wave. Okay. Because second wave, it didn't give us chance for reinfection at all. Everybody yes. were infected. Yes. Um, so again, I'm not sure about the testing, but one thing is if you produce an immune response, that doesn't mean that you will probably the COVID, uh, those particles are still in the body, but they're not, I mean, it was uh, in many study, it came that COVID uh, viral particles remain in your body for a long time. So you will probably be uh, positive for, uh, if you do the COVID test for a long time. And this, again, the immune, uh, sorry, I forgot to mention this, the immune response also varies from person to person. So for example, how many are we? So if 49 of us get COVID infection, the response will be highly varied from one person to another. It's not a homogeneous response. So again, going back to, so there is, it's not a homogeneous response that probably in the first time, if they were asymptomatic, there's not enough immune response at all to be mounted for a person to be, but they were COVID positive, as you say. So again, it has to be clarified if they were positive, negative, going back again and again, how was the disease severity? Did they had a mild asymptomatic, which category did they come into? Did it require hospitalization? If the second, uh, if reinfection, as we say, the reinfection, did it cause severe COVID or hospitalization? Because the point is, we might get again and again COVID, but it's the disease severity that matters. A vaccine also do not guarantee that you will not be reinfected. Vaccine guarantee protection from reinfection. Okay. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Swati. Uh, I, will, I think we'll hold the questions for time being. We'll finish the next speaker and then take all the questions to the end. I would like to introduce our second speaker for the day, Dr. Vivek Nayak. He did his MBBS from Kim's Bangalore and post MBBS, he was trained in anesthesia and critical care at Nayak Hospital, Mumbai. Uh, then he went on to do cardiac anesthesia from the Narayana Institute, Bengaluru. And then he moved on to UK to complete his training uh, in critical care only, but then 
due to some personal reasons, I think he had uh, some fascination towards infectious diseases and microbiology. That's a very nice thing, so, because not many people choose microbiology as a subject. But uh, he took on um, to do his uh, FRC in uh, microbiology and infectious diseases. And currently, he's working as a consultant at Halifax and Huddersfield Hospitals, West Yorkshire, UK. So you can start your presentation. Thanks, Kala. Uh, can everyone hear me? Yeah, yeah, you're audible. Thank you. So I'm just loading my slides. Um, Hello, uh, I'm struggling to load my slides. It's coming on my laptop saying uh, open system preference, security, and privacy to grant access. Um, Dr. Vivek, since you're the co host, you can easily share, unless uh, there is some problem in your. Uh, yeah, yeah, my computer is. Uh, yeah, it's too many uh, barriers and firewalls on this. Um, your laptop is immune then <laughs> possible yes <laughs> to all sorts of viruses and things um i can start can, can, can you share it to somebody else so that we can share your slides oh yeah sure wasu um, or somebody wasu can you give me give your email id there you can share sure, sure. sure you can share it to me as well oh, okay. uh, fine uh, ravi i'll send it to you um, yeah just give us presentation bartta illa yena paithar ninda Maybe we can have a look at a few questions when we are arranging this. Okay, thanks very much, Shastai. Thank you for your services. Ravi, can you give me your email, please? Yeah, sorry. Yeah, great, yeah, thank you. Uh, it'll be drravikare at gmail.com. No, you will have to ask me. I will have to ask you. 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 ಗುಡ್ ಆಫ್ಟರ್ನೂನ್ ಎವ್ರಿ ಒನ್ ಐ ಡೋಂಟ್ ವೇಸ್ಟ್ ಮೈ ಟೈಮ್ ವೇಸ್ಟ್ ಯೋರ್ ಟೈಮ್ ಐ ಸ್ಟಾರ್ಟ್ ದಿ ಪ್ರೆಸೆಂಟೇಷನ್ ವೈಲ್ ರವಿ ಲೋಡ್ಸ್ ಸ್ಲೈಡ್ಸ್ I think uh, Swati spoke very well um, regarding the uh, immun immunity and immunogenesis for against COVID. Um, I'm going to concentrate on the microbiology aspect. So I'm going to start with the uh, variants and uh, then we'll go move on to the vaccines and uh, vaccine efficacy in different uh, special situations and uh, what's happening with the variants currently. um mutation is a, a 
unwritten rule like we say when humans are born the only thing that is definite is death so when it comes to viruses mutation is the unwritten rule you will see it every moment every time something is happening um in with respect to viral infections uh, to give you any example is uh, hiv uh, where we are targeting different uh, stages of the viral replication in the antiretroviral therapy so every time there is a mutation these these uh, antiviral drugs become uh, ineffective and we call it as resistant so similar in those lines um all viruses have this mutations happening all the time the most important difference in them is that when significant number of mutations accumulate together uh, they become they generate a structural change in that particular virus and if that structural change is for the virus to gain survival advantage if that virus does not have get that survival advantage that virus will die so that is the most basic concept you need to understand that why viruses mutate and why viruses show variation to give you another example is influenza <clears throat> we had the first influenza well as far as we are aware was the 1918 spanish pandemic in which millions of people died and we thought it's over no it wasn't we had a further global epidemic in 1958 when we had an asian pandemic where thousands of asians have died during this uh, further um, epidemic following that we again had it in hong kong in 1968 and uh, again so many people died during that all these things it is the same virus the influenza virus but with the change in accumulation of mutations which has led to change in its neuraminidase or the hemagglutinin protein which has led to failure of antibodies binding and has led to mass infection and pandemic and significant mortalities so the same thing will happen every time there is a new new virus new infection new outbreak so that is what we are calling as variant now when there is a change in the characteristic of these viruses they are man- labeling them as variant under investigation or vic but when that is leading to significant increase in clinical infection transmission uh, reduced the response to the therapy they become variant of concern or voc uh, that's how i would like to introduce you to this variation variants this is my hospital you can see on the slide um uh, called dell and huddersfield uh, nhs trust and uh, i work as a, a microbiology consultant and infection control lead here uh, ravi next slide <coughs> so uh, for following the recent uh, uh, WHO classification the system has been changed and now they have introduced these uh, greek letters for uh, this thing so they have started off saying that the uk variant is alpha uh, the indian variant is delta and similarly south african may be labeled as beta and gamma there are other variants also as shown in this picture which are emerging but essentially they all depend upon mutation or variation or change in the um, genetic makeup of this of the virus and when there is a change in the structural integrity or transmission characteristics that they manifest with a different uh, clinical picture next one ravi uh, ravi i think it's difficult for you to share over the phone you can send it to me i will share it from the laptop you might be getting frequent calls Okay, I'll do that. Thank you. Yeah, uh, I will, will. So, continuing with the uh, with the variants, uh, 
variants have been studied from the beginning. Uh, the most important uh, one was uh, initially from uh, the China, where Wuhan, where the first uh, um, cases were detected. And they are the ones who helped in uh, analysis of the genome and then shared it across the globe so that people are aware of uh, the uh, in genetic makeup of the initial virus so that the, any variation from the initial virus can be built up. Now these variants are expressed based on the nuclear change in the nucleotide sequence in the uh, genome of the virus. Uh, and they have been expressed or uh, they, are, they are expressed in various forms of which the most important one is what we call as the pangolin diagram or the linear graph wherein the initial gene um, is expressed in the beginning and then the further variations are uh, expressed in the form of a linear graph and the longer the line from the initial uh, starting point higher the frequency of changes. And then when these changes have accumulated, they have led to a completely different strain, which has been called as the variant. And from there, they have built up further changes and to show that how they were different from the original strains. As in when this slide comes up on this uh, thing, I'll be, I'll be able to show you the these diagrams, how they have been uh, actually shown um, pictorially. Um, They have been, um, if you look at the genome of the uh, the COVID virus, uh, there are four or five important uh, genomic uh, sites that are involved with this uh, variation, of which uh, most important is the spike protein genome, followed by what we call as open reading frame proteins, of which there are two, 1A and 1B. And there is also a nucleocapsid uh, genome. These are the sites that have been primarily involved in these um, variants. The reason why we are more interested in them is because most of the immune response uh, to the uh, SARS-CoV-2 is targeted against these proteins, the spike proteins and the nucleocapsid proteins. And uh, whenever there has been a mutation significant enough to bring about a structural change that has been uh, reduced response or a reinfection. But it has been very difficult to quantify to what extent this will lead to a reinfection or which patient will be susceptible to a reinfection and who will be not. Um, for that, we need to understand the genomes even more in depth. At present, it has been difficult. Um, Uh, Praveen, can you go down to the next slide? Yep, these are the four important uh, uh, variants that I, I, I mentioned. B117, uh, which is the UK variant of the alpha. Uh, the second one, B11351, which is the South African variant or the beta variant. Um, there has been significant change in with respect to transmissibility between these variants. For example, compared to the Wuhan strain, uh, the uh, alpha or the UK variant was found to be 50% more transmissible. And if you remember the second uh, wave in India, majority of the isolates from Delhi were UK variants, not Indian variants. Whereas if you come to South India, what we found is the Delta variant was the most common uh, isolate and it was found to be 20 to 40% more transmissible than the UK variant. And uh, that was found to be the major source of outbreak in the southern, all five South Indian states. Now what has happened, it's, it has reversed. Now the Indian variant or the Delta variant has become the major uh, isolate in the UK now. We are currently having 90% of the total new daily positive cases are of this Indian variant. And uh, it's uh, causing a day-to-day -day rise in the reported new cases. But fortunately, there has not been a proportionate increase in the hospital admission or mortality. Although there is a marginal rise, but it is not rising as, as 
um, exponentially as the number of new positive cases. Many couple of reasons for that. One is that um, almost 80 to 85 percent of the population at our about 30 years of age has been vaccinated. Majority of the new positive cases are seen in the population in the age bracket of 10 to 18 years who have got no underlying, uh, majority of whom have no underlying uh, uh, health problems and can cope with this uh, infection like another flu or a cold. And that's why the hospital admission rates are less and uh, the mortality is also not increased much. There is not much pressure on the intensive care unit beds. Uh, in spite of that, the government has um, postponed the uh, relaxation of uh, the um, lockdown five by another four weeks. So we will still be under lockdown till 19th of July. Uh, next slide, Pramin. This is the diagram I was telling you about. Uh, this is the linear diagram. Uh, the centermost portion is the part where you will see the um, uh, initial picture from where the variants are drawn up. And as, as you go around, you can see that the depending upon how much is the variation from the baseline variants, their height, they can be expressed in this form. If you see a scientific journal related to any variants, you will see this picture. That is what it means, essentially. Next one, Praveen. This is the genome, as I explained to you. Uh, this is the genome and uh, of the, the left side one is the genome of the uh, SARS-CoV-2 virus. And the right one is the protein structures, which are uh, primarily involved in the immunogenicity and are involved in the immune response. If they lead to change in the structure of these proteins uh, as shown by the arrowheads, that will lead to um, either enhanced uh, reinfection or it will lead to depending upon the characteristic in, uh, involved, they could be more transmissible from person to person leading to a further log, uh, wave of uh, pandemic or increased cases, increased mortality. Next one, Brian. Vivek, uh, can you accept my remote uh, remote connection? Oh, yeah, so can. You, uh, you, if you accept, you can just go ahead and do the... Oh, maneuvering. Okay. Yeah. yeah, send me. I have sent it. I have sent it. Just say it says waiting for Vivek Nayak to control the screen. You just accept it. Okay. Then on your own, you can uh, change the slides. Okay, otherwise let's move on, yeah. Thank you. Um, coming, back, coming to the uh, vaccines, uh, again, um, it could be, uh, I won't take a lot of time of yours. Um, it could be a whole, well, whole cell vaccine or it could be a component vaccine as uh, Swati mentioned. Uh, in whole cell vaccine, you could have live attenuated vaccine. There are no live, whole live vaccines, uh, non-attenuated vaccines for COVID. Well, live attenuated vaccines have been used, inactivated vaccines have been used, or killed vaccines have been used, they all are whole vaccines, or the components have been used, which could be based on the mRNA, or it could be based on the protein subunit antigen of the virus, or it could be that the genome of the virus has been loaded into a carrier uh, vector, like uh, chim um, chimpanzee adenovirus, uh, used in the case of Ox AstraZeneca vaccine. Yeah, and these things, I think uh, Swati has uh, dealt with them. Um, whole virus vaccine, for example, Covaxin, uh, which has been, uh, in which uh, the virus, live virus grown in the laboratory condition uh, has been inactivated by uh, using beta propiolactone. Essentially what beta propiolactone does is it denatures the genome. So <clears throat> the genome is destroyed. So the virus is no more capable of replicating. However, the surface components of the virus, which are essential for the immune response are still there and they provoke immune response and bring up the um, uh, antibody response. 
but they do not lead to infection. That's the most important thing to understand in this. Next one. Uh, nucleic acid based vaccines, as in the case of Pfizer BioNTech vaccine, wherein they have used the mRNA. Uh, again, here you have injecting pure mRNA into the patient. So, mRNA enters into the cytoplasm, uses the cell machinery, and starts producing uh, uh, the uh, spike protein. This mRNA used in this vaccine is specifically of the spike protein. That's why if you use, if your patient has used Pfizer BioNTech or Moderna vaccine, if you want to check the antibody titer, you are looking at spike protein antibody titer. If you find that the patient has got antibody titer against any other component of the vaccine, let's say nucleocapsid, that means that patient has had infection, not and the immunity is not due to um, the uh, spike uh, the vaccination, because vaccination produces only spike protein. If there is an antibody against any other protein, then it's not because of the vaccine. It's simple. Next one, please. Viral vector, as I mentioned, Covishield. Um, I have already mentioned that. And last one is the protein subunit vaccine. No vaccine. This is still under uh, trial, uh, <clears throat> wherein the protein subunit of the uh, virus has been utilized uh, to, to uh, provoke immune system and to make it generate um, antibodies against the uh, virus. Next one. Yeah, next. Uh, yeah, next one. This is one I wanted to tell you about. Uh, sorry, go back, Pravin, sorry. Yeah, uh, so it's a chimpanzee adenovirus vaccine. Uh, the, this is a COVID shield vaccine which is currently in use uh, in India. Uh, the chimpanzee adenovirus is used as a um, vector to carry the COVID vaccine's genome into the uh, host cell. The gene is the host chimpanzee adenovirus gene is modified such that it is unable to replicate. So the chimpanzee adenovirus does not cause any harm. However, there is a small possibility that the adeno that adenovirus uh, hemagglutinin protein can enhance intravascular uh, thrombotic response. That is why we have seen cases of thrombosis or cortical venous thrombosis in patients who have received AstraZeneca vaccine. This is still in the hypothesis stage. It has not yet been proven, but this is something to remember. You might get some patients who might come and ask you, oh, doctor, why are we seeing clots with this particular vaccine, but not with any others? This is one of the hypotheses that has been proposed by the German scientists. I'll come to that later. Next one. And this is our homemade made in India coaxin, uh, which, which could have been introduced much better way, uh, but uh, unfortunately uh, it was, I don't know whether it was hurried up or what, um, introduced by, by the Bharat Biotech uh, based in Hyderabad. Uh, it's uh, same as uh, the uh, uses a infective particles, no, sorry, infective whole virus, which has been completely, sort of has got its core as well as its uh, outer nucleocapsid and which has been treated with beta propiolactone to damage its genes such that it is no more unable, not able to replicate anymore, but the outer structure is intact. They did a phase one and phase two trial, wherein they said that it works, but phase three trial, they have released a press statement, but they have not still not bothered to publish what is it, the findings. Um, next one, please. <clears throat> In the last, uh, when I last did some research, they said they had released a press statement saying it is 78% effective, but they are not backed up backed up with the data. So when the, something you say is not backed up with the scientific data, people look at it suspiciously. That's why Coaxin, even though there is a company willing to manufacture and sell it from US, but it's not been approved by FDA yet. So they still have to hold off. So once any vaccine passes through the um, phase three trial, they it will go through the regulator. So for example, 
FDA in US, MHRA in, U in UK or ICMR in Delhi who will go through the research work and see if this is genuine and if it can be introduced in the um, community for widespread use. Um, in UK, this was done by the MHRA. Um, in, on December 2nd, UK was the first country to approve a, this vac any vaccine. Pfizer-BioNTech was first approved in the UK. First patient to get the vaccine was also from UK. Similarly, the Oxford AstraZeneca also got approval in the December 2020, such that from there are two vaccines available for use in the 2021. And that, that's how UK got on with the vaccination drive earlier than uh, before other countries. Next one. This is the phase three trial uh, findings of the vaccines. Uh, I'll put PBV, that is Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine and uh, OAZV is Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine. So Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine, when they conducted the phase three trial, they found that the vaccine was 95% effective and it was consistently effective across all age, gender, ethnicity, and comorbidities, including asthma, obesity, diabetes, hypertension, and lung disease. That's why US was very quick to hold on to it and ban the export of that until all the demands and needs of the US were met. Whereas Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine in the initial trial, in the third phase trial, there were a couple of hiccups, like there was one phase where uh, lower dose was given, then a standard dose was given, there was a group where the three weeks uh, uh, gap was not strictly maintained. But when they looked at the overall picture, what they found was that <clears throat> after two doses, it was 70% efficacious. But in, in the cohorts where the small uh, initially low dose was given and then the standard dose was given, efficacy was found to be 80%. 80, 80%. Also in the uh, cohorts where the time gap was longer than three weeks. They found that the efficacy was better. And that formed the UK's basis for prolonging the gap between the two vaccines by more than three weeks, disregarding the findings of the research from the other findings and said, no, we will do this. Let's see what happens. We have data to back it up. Moderna vaccine, again, equal in line with the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine with an efficacy of 94.94%. Uh, but it was primarily seen you know, those with age 64 or higher. And vaccine efficacy was found to be 100% um, in uh, preventing severe disease. That was the advantage of the Moderna vaccine. Next one. As I said, we're still waiting. This is the uh, Google search from yesterday. I'll put it to see what the, comes up if I say co-vaccine phase three trial data. And each search comes up with its own findings. One says uh, Bharat Biotech has submitted the data to WHO. Other one says Bharat Biotech has uh, refused to, to say that it has submitted the data. So we, the whole world is waiting to know what exactly is the phase three trial findings. Uh, the company has said 78%, but until there is a data to back it up, it will be difficult to say that this, this is the case. Next one. So here you have the influence of age, gender, BMI, and uh, the comorbidities on the antibody response to Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine. If you see the uh, whisker and spike uh, graph for the four on the right side, uh, the A, B on the top are for uh, age and gender, C, D on the bottom are for um, BMI and hypertension. If you see the C graph, uh, the uh, bottom uh, left, the antibody response decreases as the BMI increases. That's a bit of a concerning. That is why uh, some of the morbid patients, if they have got significant comorbidities, they have been suggested uh, uh, antibody titer. Similarly, the antibody response has been uh, much better in the fairer sex. So females have the advantage that if they had a full course of vaccine at the end of Two weeks after the second dose, they have had, they had a much higher antibody titer, the p value of less than 0.02, as against the their male counterpart. Hypertension, diabetes have not had any impact on the uh, antibody response. Next one, please. 
adverse effects. Each and every vaccine has reported pain, tenderness, and warmth at the site of injection. There are no exceptions. It's very common. It's one in ten, as common as one in ten. Other 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 things: redness, fever, has been in one in one in hundred. Uh, other things like lymphadenopathy, decreased appetite, hyperhidrosis, pruritus has been reported, but very rarely. Neuroinflammatory disorders like transverse myelitis was reported in one of the trials in Brazil, which led to stoppage of the um, phase three trial for a short period before it was restarted, and uh, a different cause was found for it. Next one, please. <coughs> Stability. Now, as uh, uh, Swati mentioned, Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine contains the mRNA, so, and so does the Moderna vaccine, but I don't know why there is a difference in the temperature, but both of them have to be maintained at sub-zero temperature because the half-life of mRNA within the cell itself is, is uh, 10 hours, and I don't know how long it is if you outside the cell and how long it is in a cold storage, but they are very, very temperature sensitive. If they are degraded, they are of no use. They don't provoke any, they don't get into the cell and produce uh, the proteins. If they don't produce proteins, they are useless. That's why they are very, very temperature sensitive. Whereas Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine can be stored up to, in a domestic refrigerator at two to eight degrees centigrade. Now, all three of them have a shelf life of six months. Sorry, Moderna has seven months, others have six months. Uh, because these two vaccines are stored at uh, sub-zero temperature, Moderna and Pfizer, uh, they have to be thawed um, um, for at least three hours before you before they are uh, used. And I agree with uh, Seema that uh, now uh, thawed vaccines are available, which can be kept for one month. Yes, uh, but uh, we don't know how long how, uh, about their efficacy. There is no study uh, published about whether they're as efficacious as those stored and uh, thawed just before the use. <clears throat> All three are temperature sensitive, which means they have to be protected from uh, sunlight. Um, both the mRNA containing vaccines have preservative, whereas Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine is preservative free because the genome is within a carrier uh, virus. And uh, presentation, very important. Um, uh, Pfizer vaccine is delivered in a, a multi-pack container with 975 doses in each pack, such that once used, it has to be used within six hours. And if anything is not used within six hours, it just goes to the bin. The similar same is not the case with the Moderna, which is served in a 10-dose pack, while Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine is stored in a provided in a 10-dose vial which can be offered as eight to 10 doses. So it's about 80 to 100 doses per pack. So stability wise, Oxygen, uh, Oxford AstraZeneca or the Covishield vaccine has a definite advantage and is, the, and is certainly one of the best option for as far as the Indian situation is concerned. Next one. <clears throat> yep. As I mentioned, Covishield vaccine, which is the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine, um, containing uh, the genome for the uh, spike protein uh, in the replication deficient adenovirus vector uh, expresses the uh, SARS-CoV-2 spike protein gene, which instructs the host cell to produce protein of the S antigen unique to that particular virus in response to which the antibodies are produced and thus producing their primary immune, primary immune response. Next one, please. This is the contents. Um, some of them, in, there could be history of allergy. Uh, of one of them is the polysorbate, which is has been suspected to be the agent causing the immediate or type of reaction in some of the patients, not all, but something that you should be aware of. So that's why patients are observed for 15 minutes after the vaccination. But this vaccine does not contain any preservatives, nor contains any egg or animal products that contraindicates it for any religious reasons. Next one, please. Um, when we offer the vaccine in the UK, we, say, we, we mention these specific uh, uh, situations um, as uh, precautions. The number one is if the patient has got multiple uh, uh, drug allergies, 
if the patient had a prior systemic reaction with the previous dose uh, or if the patient has got allergy to any of the components uh, of the vaccine then we say uh, do not offer the covid shield vaccine but we need we say cautious when the patient has got anaphylaxis to multiple different classes of drugs or anaphylaxis to a previous vaccination uh, but they are not absolute contraindications we observe them for a longer period and then we send them home and uh, as you can see patient characteristics we need to look at and what action we need to take this is clearly given by the you can comment and we strictly follow this and if there is any any of if any patient ticks any of these boxes we say no you need to stay next one uh this is the uh, first paper published with respect to efficacy of the covid shield vaccine wherein they looked at they offered the uh, vaccine in three different countries brazil south africa and the united kingdom um and uh, they collated the data the only uh, drawback from this trial was that um they they had two groups one was the uh, the test group and the in the control group or in the control group in uk they offered a placebo in the form of uh, saline but uh, in in the form of menby vaccine but they offered uh, saline in other countries or one of the other vaccines which which now they think that shouldn't have been done or it, it might have impacted the uh, outcome of the trial uh, next one please that's the specific data we are looking at the primary efficacy analysis clearly showing that uh, each uh, having the 60 to 70% uh, effective initially but as the duration is prolonged the efficacy improves even with the first dose <clears throat> whereas uh, um, as it can the efficacy can improve up to 80 to 90 days after the single dose but two doses has offered a much better protection uh, after a gap of up to 30 up to 90 uh, days i'll show you that graph next one next please and so next graph yeah next there you go if you look at this graph uh, the vaccine has been offered at zero and and on the x x axis is the weeks uh, between the doses as you can see the red line is the median and the gray area is the confidence interval from 0 to 14 weeks there is a gradual increase in the efficacy of the vaccine with the narrow confidence interval saying that the uh, efficacy was as predicted in the test result but after 14 weeks there was widening of the confidence interval which means that our result could be either unreliable or by chance or it could be biased so that is why the uk government said okay 14 weeks up to 14 weeks it's reliable data so let's take 12 weeks or as a cut off give two weeks leeway in case for some reasons they get a, um, their appointment cancelled or uh, if there was any problem with the um, vaccination that is why we still recommend 12 weeks uh, with until the new variant came into picture i'll show you that in subsequent slides next please so how do we know how how well is it working uh, how long the immunity lasts who will be protected and who will not be protected so in order to study that um, the public health england what they did was they used us as the the healthcare workers of the, the trial participants or scapegoats whatever you call it and we were asked to give drug we were, we were asked to give our blood samples we were asked to, we were prioritized on the immunization list and then we were asked say told that can you please get involved in, the, in this trial to see uh, how long the immunity lasts so they conducted this sars cov2 immunity and reinfection evaluation trial so or siren and um, everybody has access to this what they are doing is every uh, the healthcare workers who have given informed consent are giving regularly their bloods and throat swabs and checking is the antibody how long the antibody titer continues to rise how long the antibody response sustains and when do we say that okay this has reached the bottom line beyond this 
the antibody titer is not sufficient enough to sustain that anti, uh, antibody response when there is a reinfection. So we need to give a booster dose. So in future, the findings from this trial is going to answer whether we are going to need a booster dose of uh, COVID vaccine in, our, uh, in among ourselves or among our patients or not. Next one, please. Yeah, as I mentioned, uh, in, the, in the latest uh, publication from them, uh, they have said that uh, at the end of five months after the uh, vaccination, 83% pe people were protected against reinfection. But this doesn't mean 17% are not protected. It simply means that the antibody titer has been sustained in 83% of the people. But if they have a reinfection, there might be secondary response which can um, if if it is not due to the mutant strain, it might provoke a much stronger uh, antibody response as we have seen in the, our uh, physiological response to uh, primary immunity and uh, uh, primary response and secondary responses. So among the, these patients, among the 6,600 participants involved in this uh, um, trial, only four, 44 cases of potential reinfections were identified. Um, but uh, we don't know how many, there were much more people who were positive with the throat swabs, thus raising the concern that immunity, uh, vaccination induced immunity may or may not protect against carrier status. They can still carry. This, that is where this study came into picture and brought up that point. Um, this making uh, it mandatory for us as healthcare workers to do we what's called we do a lateral flow test wherein a, we test ourselves twice a week, make sure that we are not the carriers that are causing the infection or outbreak in the hospital in the UK. Uh, next one, please. So once we had the vaccination, so this is the standard advice given. It will say that uh, up to four days, everything is fine. Don't worry, you'll have pain, you'll have fever, you'll have uh, headache, you'll have no, uh, all side effects. But if anything persists, beyond four days or starts something starts after four days up to four weeks then you should seek immediate help and especially new severe headache a headache that seems worse or visual symptoms like blurring of vision speech disturbance seizures drowsiness or weakness um, sensory uh, hallucinations shortness of breath chest pain leg swelling or persistent abdominal pain so these are all been given keeping the thrombo cortical venous thrombo uh, the uh, intravascular thrombosis in mind so concentrating on the chest abdomen and the neurological uh, possibility of uh, neurological symptoms as a possible uh, cause for their symptoms next one so we'll come to the special situation most important one blood clots yeah next one um we conducted this trial, we did this post-vaccination surveillance in UK and where we have found that the incidence of clot formation, intravascular clot formation is one in a ten, one in 100,000 on those aged more than 40. But unfortunately, the incidence was found to be slightly higher in younger patients. Uh, it was one in 50,000 among the patients who were studied. And it was more common from four days to four weeks after the uh, vaccination. And this is what brought up the change here, wherein the UK government said uh, not to offer Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine in people aged less than 40. By then, the vaccination drive was already in progress for those who are in 30 to 40. So the government said, Med said no for uh, uh, the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine for those who are aged 30 or less. So they are, they are all getting the Pfizer vaccine currently. Next one. This was the uh, German paper uh, that uh, was linked to this. Uh, it, in fact, it was the German, Germans who raised the first concern about the thrombus formation, wherein they published this case report of 11 cases of which nine of them were women. Uh, mean age was 36. Uh, only one patient had significant hematological uh, comorbidity in the form of von Willebrand's disease. And what they noted was that uh, median uh, days of, uh, of presentation was nine days after vaccination and uh, cerebral cortical vein was 
thrombosis was the most common. It is seen in nine patients. Splanchnic vein, uh, that's portal and the mesenteric veins in three patients and uh, others four of which two were pulmonary embolism and one each were peripheral venous uh, uh, thrombus and a renal vein thrombus. One patient had an intracranial bleed, which was presumed to be secondary to the DIC induced. And uh, the most common striking feature was the thrombocytopenia. All the patients were had low platelet counts. And uh, when they studied the coagulation profile, it was matching that of heparin-induced thrombocytopenia, despite the fact that none of these 11 patients re ever received heparin as a part of their treatment regime or anything in the preceding six months, up to up six months or even before that. And there was evidence of DIC in uh, five out of these 11 cases. Next one. Um, as I mentioned before, the presumed pathophysiology was the, um, the receptors of this uh, chimpanzee adenovirus vector, with, which were cross-reacting with the platelets and forming the immune complex that was activating the coagulation system. The other me proposed mechanism was probably the DNA from the adenovirus and the RNA from the, um, the COVID, vi COVID virus uh, protein, which uh, formed a molecular complex and when bound to the platelet activation factor four, that provoked uh, uh, antibodies, uh, which were similar to the one that cross react with the um, uh, heparin, uh, because uh, it was found that it formed a cationic molecule, poly, 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 poly ionic molecule, similar to the heparin platelet activation four complex. And that led to the formation of uh, thrombus in the major veins. The evidence, further evidence came from the fact that the platelet activation factor four and heparin binding assay was con uniformly positive in all these patients, thus making it the test of choice if you suspect a cortical venous thrombosis due to the oxidative axis and axis. The only treatment that has been shown to work is high dose Im intravenous immunoglobulin in the dose of one gram per kg per day for two days was the therapeutic options. <clears throat> Things that they said avoid is don't offer platelet transfusion unless there is evidence of bleeding and patient's HB is dropping. Don't offer heparin. Instead, consider alternatives, alternatives like apixaban and, and fundoparinia because of the risk of uh, DIC. And also they said avoid vitamin K antagonists, again, due to the risk of uh, hyperconagulable state. <clears throat> Next one. Very important one, vaccine hesitancy. Um, many people are saying no to vaccine, but actual incidence of anti-vax is less than, vaccines is less than 10%. Majority of the people are uh, vaccine hesitancies. So, which is defined as uh, a delay in acceptance or refusal of vaccine despite availability of the immunization service. And it is the leading cause of declining immunization rates in high income regions such as both Europe and in North America. Next one. So how do you, these are the three common causes. Complacency, because the people's belief that, oh, the prevalence of the disease is very low in our area, why should we have it? Um, but that was very common here in Europe. But once they had a big major peak and then subsequent uh, the second wave, that complacency came down. People started accepting the vaccines. Next one is confidence, lack of trust in the authority, uh, misinformation via the social media, WhatsApp universities, or the people's beliefs uh, that it causes impotency or suspicion that it they are going uh, the Microsoft and uh, Bill Gates is introducing, making us his, whatever, um, making us his slave. So that belief that that lack of confidence or trust in the authority also was the second uh, cause for vaccine hesitancy. And the most important with respect to the, the developing world is convenience, availability, affordability of the uh, vaccine. It's not just about uh, affordability. It's also about the fact that if somebody goes for vaccination, their one day um, pay or salary will be sacrificed. Uh, 
inability to understand the importance of the um, vaccination, perceived quality of the uh, service provided. Uh, if something is given free, then if the people think it in two ways, oh, good service, or they say, oh, why is he giving free? Is there something? Or cultural context, people look at it and say, oh, the, va the vaccine has been, the infection has been there for a year now. Why are they giving it now? Why, why, why did it take this long? And uh, they say that uh, those who have had vaccine are dying. So you see different parts of the world, you'll see different uh, um, approaches towards this the vaccine uh, hesitancy. Next one, please. So as I mentioned, travel cost, loss of ages for the developing world, uh, fear of impact on the health if they develop any problems, misinformation, mistrust, rumors, poor communication, and uh, developed world, also involved in this fourth one, which is the unknown long-term consequences. Everyone, when you try to explain somebody, they say, oh, we don't know what's gonna happen in next, gonna happen in next 10 years. They say, we know the disease only for the last 18 months. Even I don't know what was gonna happen two years ago, but now this is a situation. If we survive, we will see what happens in 10 years. Next one. And this is one of the paper articles from, uh, I think it came from the Reuters, uh, which said that instead of vaccination, we will pray for to Lord that save us. Uh, next one. Or this man who became uh, magnetic from Nashik um, after taking the vaccine. And there were so many YouTube videos following this showing that magnets were sticking to them after taking the vaccine. But uh, fortunately it was disproved and uh, somebody had to come out with a statement saying it's not possible. Uh, next one. So the best way of overcoming hesitancy is clear line of communication. Practice what you preach, which is what is the best thing uh, seen um, in developing world. Uh, restrictions on mis misinformation, uh, like social media. Educating the people. Um, leadership, that is what is all lacking uh, in Indian context, both locally and nationally when it comes to uh, accepting vaccination or or uh, promoting vaccination. Um, yeah. And uh, somebody, very important story from CMC Velour, I thought I should share with you. It came up on the Western media because it's considered as one of the premier educational institutions. A tertiary hospital with five campuses and 2,700 hospital beds. When the vaccination campaign was launched, after six weeks, 30% um, of the staff had still not had vaccines. Uh, most of them was due to, again, misinformation, hesitancy, rather than anti vaxxers They're saying that we read this on the social media and we read that on the uh, social media. So the best thing they did was the administrators, the dean, the uh, head of the departments um, took the vaccines and put that, took a photo and put it on the uh, social media, saying that we are the heads, we are the ones who introduced this, see, we are taking it, why are you worried? And following that, the result was that within two weeks, 99% of the doctors and the 90% of the healthcare workers who were, had completely received their vaccine uh, against COVID. So this is what needs to happen when there is a, an issue with the vaccine hesitancy. Um, until then, it's difficult. Next one. Yep, the, the other, other uh, causes, mistrust about healthcare providers. Some of them say, but they have not received the vaccine. Uh, again, that's a major problem in UK, hesitancy on the part of the healthcare workers to be vaccinated. Um, healthcare workers were one of the, which includes doctors, nurses, physio, everyone, everyone who works in the hospitals, right from the dean of the hospital to the porter who pushes the trolley, they are all considered as healthcare workers. They were prioritized for vaccination in the UK and it's almost 12 months now still there are so many people who are not vaccinated. And I think UK government is thinking about bringing in a legislation saying that making it mandatory for people working in healthcare sector to have the vaccine. But I don't know how it's gonna work out. Um, unknown long-term consequences, as I mentioned previously, impact on fertility and misinformation. This is the problem in the developed world as well. Next one. 
coming to the special situations again cancer and hematology and chemotherapy and post transplant patients uh, if you look at the graph the antibody response has been um, good in patients who have the cancer but have not had chemotherapy or transplant they they have a matching antibody response to those who are without uh, cancer but the only thing was that if provided they have not had chemotherapy so the igg values uh, post vaccination was matching with that of the um, patients who have had normal response by the end of day 50 day 60 with a very few outliers but the, the picture changes with the chemotherapy next one so 94.5% of the patients who had there are two studies that have quoted this one is from the new york city where they studied 261 patients with the solid organ solid organ cancer and they found that 94.5% of these patients they studied had measurable clinically significant igg antibody titers um at the end of two weeks from the uh, completion of the immunization a similar study conducted i think it's in israel uh, wherein they studied also studied sol- patient with solid organ cancer undergoing chemotherapy where they found that 90% zero positivity rate within one week after two doses of the vaccines in uh, 102 patients yeah it's in israel yes uh, so patients with solid organ transplant you can in solid organ cancer you can say yes but it changes significantly when it comes to solid organ transplant next one this is the form liver transplant kidney transplant lung transplant cardiac transplant they are usually requiring up to 3 doses they the same gentleman boyarsky from you know, from us conducted the trial and found that the single dose response was only in 17% after second dose it was only 56% but he offered a third dose to his patients a selective um, cohort of patients and found that the it reached significant levels only after the third dose now this is this was a case series the third dose uh, part so they are doing a further blind trial to see if that can be established if yes probably or solid organ transplant patients will soon start getting a third dose of vaccine just to achieve that level of efficacy next one women reproductive age groups yeah again okay. next one um all the uh, countries in the world are currently offering encouraging uh pregnant women to have the uh oxford have the covid vaccine uh pfizer and moderna has been uh widely promoted oxford as as nfa we don't have data on the um this thrombosis r- risk remember that uh, pregnancy is a hypercoagulable state we don't know whether giving covid shield to them, to them will induce um Uh, further increase the risk of thrombosis but uh, absence of evidence is not evidence of absence which is why um, the worldwide they are promoting and saying that yes women in childbearing age women who are having ivf women who are in the who are pregnant uh, in second or third trimester women who are breastfeeding all of them should have uh, vaccination against uh, covid um you can use us or both are promoting pfizer or moderna because of the lack of data um, but i think uh, the federation of obstetrics and gynecology society of india has recently released a press statement saying that we we should the benefit of vaccination is more than the risk here so we should go ahead and promote uh, vaccination and hence all the pregnant women in second and third trimester are offered vaccination and also the breastfeeding uh, mothers a uh, very important thing is we don't this vaccine is uh, we don't know what is the impact of this vaccine if it is given in the first trimester again due to the lack of data currently we are not knowingly offering it in the first trimester but soon we will have more data about it and then we will be able to confirm the the evidence for this came from this uh, publication from cdc wherein they offered vaccination to all the uh, women in the reproductive age group who later on confirmed as uh, pregnant and found that it was uh, very efficacious and helped in reducing the incidence of covid in this population 
and hence they promoted uh, use of this uh, um, vaccine. Next one. What when they studied the population, they found that the pregnant women are at a much higher risk, and like admission to ICU was a risk ratio of three um, compared to non-pregnant women. They are more likely to receive invasive ventilation with a risk ratio of 2.9. They're more likely to end up on an ECMO with a risk ratio of 2.4, and they're more likely to die. One in 1.2 to one point with one in a 1.7 or 70 percent more chance of death than non-pregnant women. And when they looked at it from the racial point of view, they found that the Hispanic women are even higher risk than the non-Hispanic women. So that's when the promoter said we should promote vaccination in the pregnant women because the benefits are more than the risks. Next one. Yep, and most importantly, there is no evidence that this, any of these vaccines interfere with fertility or produce, cause impotency. There is no evidence of transmission of infection, live virus from mother to the fetus because none of the viruses are replicating viruses. They all contain only a component of the vaccine or they contain a killed vaccine. So there is no question of transmitting infection from to mother to baby. There is no reported teratogenic effects. Um, people who were unaware, none, none of these women in reproductive age group are offered a, a, a pregnancy test before their vaccine dose. But if they later on find that they, were, they are pregnant, they have been encouraged to uh, report so that the government can follow up them up and see if the vaccine has got any teratogenic effect or any any effect on the newborn or the, on the fetus. So, and uh, there has been no reported case of miscarriage, low birth weight, preterm birth, stillbirth, or any congenital anomalies. There is evidence of transmission via breast milk, but only the immunoglobulins are transmitted and thus protecting the newborn with the IgG. There is no evidence of uh, viral particles or anything secreted in the breast milk. And the risk of thromboembolic complications are no more than the non-pregnant women. So this making it a preferred choice for uh, vaccination. Next one. Contraindi general contraindications, as I mentioned, allergic reactions, NFL access to any of the components of the vaccines are, are the two main ones. Uh, the others are um, anybody who had uh, in, uh, diagnosed with the infection in the last 12 weeks, now that has been that keeps changing depending upon the nature of the uh, infection. Uh, in children, it is now currently in UK they recommend seven weeks. In uh, other population, they recommend four weeks. Um, or patients with currently who have got active symptoms of infection, like if somebody has been admitted, then we say go home, come back after 28 days after your symptoms have settled. Or COVID patients treated with anti-COVID monoclonal antibodies. This is only because the monoclonal antibodies can neutralize the um, spike proteins or whatever produced in response to the um, vaccination or somebody who's acutely unwell and hospitalized. And this is just to prevent any confusion between whether it, this is vaccine induced or it's due to their underlying medical problem. Next one. HIV, again, yeah, next one. There's ample data to uh, show that the HIV vac uh, vaccination in HIV patients is uh, very safe and it, pro promote, it provokes the same amount of response as non-HIV patients in those who have got CD4 count of more than 350 or their uh, CD4, CD8 ratio is normal. Um, there's absolutely no difference. Next one. However, if the patients have had, who are HIV positive, who are poorly controlled, high viral count or CD4 count is significantly low, then the immune response has been found to be poor in some of the uh, field trials that have not been published yet. We are still waiting. Uh, next one. Yeah, this is the slide. Um, the the uh, manufacturer of the Novax are studying that in the South Africa, uh, South African population, where they have found that the efficacy is decreased from uh, 60 to 60 percent to 49 percent, especially in the subgroup of people who are uh, HIV positive, poorly controlled, and low, high viral load, and 
low CD4 count. Um, we're still waiting for this data to be published so that we can make further recommendation as to whether we need to check the antibody titer before recommending a further booster dose of the vaccine. Next one. Um, asymptomatic patients this is a, another important class. Um, patients who have uh, got no symptoms but and accidentally found to be positive on testing. One dose offered gives 49% uh, efficacy. Two doses offered gives 61.9% protection. That means that even in asymptomatic patients, offering this vaccine does not stop transmission. They, st they are still at risk, at risk of transmission. So you need to be careful. Um, continue to wear the mask if you find that you are still persistent carrier or your lateral flow test comes back as positive. Next one. Children, very little data, uh, except the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine who conducted research in adolescent population, that is 12 to 15 years only, not below 12. UK is conducting a trial currently, which includes all children age six or more, which is still in progress. But Pfizer-BioNTech have the um, data currently, wherein they assigned one uh, 12 to 15 year old randomly in one is to one ratio to two groups, one Pfizer vaccine and other one placebo and studied them after the 21 days wherein they compared to immune response in 12 to 15 year olds with the immune response in 16 to 25 year old. Next one. And what they found was astonishing that they found that the antibody response was better in 12 to 15 year old than 16 to 25. And also what they found was that after seven days, of the second dose, not a single case of COVID was detected in those who had two doses of the vaccine, thus making it 100% effective after seven days. So this is what gave the FDA to give a nod to FDA and Canada to give a nod for offering uh, the Pfizer vaccine for uh, adolescent. The same thing has been done by Canada, Israel, and now even going to be approved by the UK as well. Next one. Variants. This is a very important one. Next one. Yeah, this is, uh, this is the uh, important paper from uh, the Public Health England where they studied the effect of various variants against the um, vaccines. And they studied 12,675 cases of which 11,000 were UK variant and 1,054 were the Indian variants. And uh, vaccine was, when they offered the vaccine, uh, it was effective against only the first dose offered adequate vaccination only in 35, 33%, whereas the second dose offered a good immune response. Can you go back then? Only four slides. No, back. Just four more. Yeah, this is the one. The, sing, the one dose was effective only in 33% as against 51, 52 found with other, other the in original variant, which, but which rose to 60% after the second dose. And this is where the panic button was pressed and said that they, that led to ban of travelers from India. And after this paper was published, then they subsequently, they conducted the trial to see what was the impact on uh, transmission and what was the impact on hospital admission? Next one. Uh, this is the same uh, paper which was which showed, which I mentioned the um, uh, efficacy of the vaccines. You can see on the column on the right side, rightmost, showing the efficacy with the Pfizer BioNTech and the Oxford AstraZeneca. It was 33% with the Pfizer. 32 with the COVID shield, which increased to 87 with the Pfizer and uh, 59 with the uh, COVID shield. But both combined together, it offered a protection of 80%. Next one. Yeah. This one looked at the hospitalization rate and, and what they found was that the um, need for I mean, the incidence of severe infection and need for hospitalization or need for ICU mechanical ventilation was reduced by 90% uh, 
and uh, 94% in uh, patients who had this delta variant yeah, next one that's one that is it uh, 94 to 96% with the Pfizer, 71 and 92% with the AstraZeneca vaccine. So you will, you there is a possibility that you will get infection which will be mild, which can be managed uh, just with uh, self-isolation and other basic measures. But the need for hospitalization or mechanical ventilation is reduced significantly if you have had two doses of uh, vaccine. Next one. I think that's it. I won't bore you with what's happening in UK. Thank you. Thank you, Vivek, for that very detailed, elaborate presentation. I think most of the questions are answered. If there are one or two which is unanswered, I think I will just put it across. There's one question if, which says that if a patient has been given Covaxin as the first dose mm -hmm. and Covishield as a second dose after six weeks, yeah, what is the advice for them? We don't recommend that. The, 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 there are two different mechanisms. One is a whole cell killed vaccine and the other one is a... a um, vector. It's a vector, yeah. So it's a... It's two different, uh, one one in one, you are exposing the immune system to the antigen of the virus. In the other one, you are, exposed, spike. You are giving the spike protein genome into the cell. So you have got two mix and match. And that's why here, what happened was they said nothing doing. If somebody has received Pfizer, they will get Pfizer only. If somebody has received AstraZeneca, they will get AstraZeneca. If you mix up, you are in trouble. That's what we were told. As healthcare workers, we have to, we had to take the responsibility for that. So it was double, triple checked every time a patient comes in with, for vaccination. That what what have you had first time? What have you had first time? Two, three people check it and make sure that they are getting the same vaccine. And every time they came for vaccination, they were all given a card on which it was clearly written what was given, and it was yes. checked. If they if they didn't have the card, they didn't get the vaccine. It was that strict. So luckily, we haven't had any incident, but. What will happen? I don't know. It's a, it's a difficult question to answer because you are using two different vaccines which are generating immunity by two different mechanisms, but you are suboptimally dosing them because you are giving it is as good as giving one dose of each. Yeah. So what uh, if what yeah. if the antibody titers are not found in a non-infected person even after two doses of the vaccine? Should we go with full booster or should it go with the complete regimen again? Uh, it, it's um. So no antibody titer at all? No antibody titer at all. That's the question. In a non-infective person. That means okay. he's not responding. He's a non-responder. Non-responder. Non, non yeah, okay. Um, currently, there is no guideline either from WHO or uh, Department of Health or even, I don't think even ICMR has any guidelines for that. Um, by I think the best approach would be to offer a booster dose of the same vaccine and say, check again. Um, the question is, was the vaccine stored appropriately? Was it uh, offered after six hours of opening from the, or reconstituting? Yes. Or was, 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 was it injected properly? Or, or has there been any mix and match? Or was it just a normal saline which was kept as a diluent was injected? There are so many things. So best thing to do would be to um, and to offer a, a further dose and see if he if his antibody titer rises. In which case, you know that it's uh, there has been something wrong the previous two times, and uh, you can check the titer and decide if you want to offer the further dose. Okay, uh, this is for uh, Swati. Yes. Yes. Kala. Are there any lymphocyte or inflammatory function assays which can predict the progress of the disease or response to vaccines in individuals? Um, okay. Lymphocyte and? And uh, inflammatory function assays. Okay. Um, so there are, uh, there are tests in, when there is infection it can be tested for different chemokines and cytokines. 
which can tell the progression of the disease from mild to moderate if there are very high levels of these uh, cytokines are there second is the antibody assays as i mentioned uh, against the spike uh, spike protein the rbd and the nucleocapsid uh, the levels of those antibodies and um, yeah mainly those and uh, basically all the inflammatory markers which are anyway done in disease case uh, in india also um, so yeah i think uh, that should be okay the testing of t cells is very difficult and very expensive endeavor even for labs in uh, uh, western countries so in india to do it on a level of diagnostic lab or hospitals is very difficult um so yeah one thing is flow cytometry can be done to detect b cells uh, checking for b cells inflammatory markers cytokines i think that can be done to check the yeah progression of disease okay uh, vivek this is for you they say in yeah. india there is 70% zero positivity mm. that's is that good enough for herd immunity <laughs> Our our government has almost shaken when the when that word was used. How do you mean? I I see. For you to use the word herd immunity, you need to know what percentage of the population, if it is vaccinated, there is no further chance of a, an an infection. For example, for polio, it was ninety six percent. For measles, it is ninety percent. I'll tell you a fascinating story. This this paper was published on MMR where they said, "Oh, MMR is associated with uh, autism," and uh, people and, and and as I said, misinformation spreads faster than the good information. So all mothers said no to MMR, and within six months, UK had a measles epi- epidemic in Wales, wherein so many children developed measles and its complications, including SSP and that is when they realized and uh, that what was the consequence of that misinformation by then it was too late anyway when they went back and checked the uh, zero prevalence they found that 81% of the people children in the school age group only had the um, significant uh, titer of measles antibody the pro- two problems one natural infection is always the best immune response provoker there is no substitute for it vaccine is come second so vaccine induced immunity always when wins off with time you need boosters to keep the boost yes up. exactly that is why when there is an outbreak they usually offer uh, offer uh, this uh, booster so coming back to this herd immunity we don't know what level of immunization in the general population will break the chain of transmission until we know that we cannot ans- we, we should not even think about the word herd immunity it's difficult to answer at this stage when it's a global pandemic we cannot answer that question now uh, one question on uh, mucormycosis yeah what what do you think is the um, cause for mucormycosis i mean the surge of mucor in india yeah i mean uh, many questions asked one was there are many hypotheses given one one first thing was that it's a part and parcel of indian variant no it's not it's not a part and parcel of indian variant because in, in now currently 91% of the new positives in the uk are indian variants and as of today there are i mean in the last 24 hours uk has reported some 10000 new positives and uk has reported more than 5 million or something but we have not had a single mucormycosis in uk how will you explain that then it's not associated with delta variant the reason why i think i may be wrong um, is one is steroid use this putting all sorts of drops and things into the airway nasal passage and all this uh, steam inhalation use of tap water for the humidifiers people are doing all sorts of things because a we have we as a um, agriculture based pop based economy already have a high incidence of subclinical fungal infection for example things like fusarium is fusarium keratitis is requiring inoculation of the eye is is um, fairly common in india whereas here 
in this country if i see a fusarium keratitis there will be 100 medical students i mean 20 consultants coming around to see the patient because they have never seen one before so so it, it's it's we have an inherent risk plus add to that the risk of steroids uh, diabetes diabetes makes you prone for fungal infections invasive fungal infections uh, steroids immunosuppression steroid is a is a f- risk factor for any all fungal candida all infections so all these things added together we made it worse by doing these things like putting the non steroidal uh, fluids liquids into the nasal passage because most of the cases were rhino cerebral rhino cerebral cerebellar uh, mucormycosis the one seen in india it was not pulmonary or uh, other type so i think that it was because of the bad practices we have generated with this uh, pandemic that led to such high incidence of mucormycosis also there are there are some some theory sorry to say that uh, zinc is associated with mucormycosis high zinc levels ferritin yeah no even zinc iron yes you're right uh, iron overload as well as desferoxamine therapy plus zinc all yes. three are associated with now iron i don't think anybody was eating iron or taking desferoxamine that's not common with the pandemic but people were taking a lot of zincovit and all as a immune booster and all this this despite showing evidence that ivermectin doesn't work azithromycin doesn't work vitamin c doesn't work vitamin d doesn't work but still people were taking supplements but we are seeing it in um, children 7 to 12 years of age coming with new cord yes that that's they, the, that's the strange they, thing that yeah that they are not exposed to i mean maybe they had, they were asymptomatic covid yeah, yeah their antibodies is turn out to be positive only when we go back and check for the antibodies it was positive hmm. they were pre diabetic they were not hmm. exposed to steroids i mean there are many cases like this also coming up hmm. where the theory of whatever we have said till now hmm. whether it's even humidifiers or water or steroids nothing is fitting into it could it be related to overcrowding or sanitation then hygienic why, condition why in a in a non uh, Oh, what do you say? Immunosuppressant state. No, you don't. You don't need to be immunosuppressed for that. Okay. You don't. So if you if your if your surrounding environment is, it's not hygienic or say moldy, dusty area. Mm-hmm. Um, you are. You are obviously your any viral infection will lower your immunity. Any. Okay. We yeah. see. Aspergillosis is not common in UK, but when some when people develop winter flu, influenza. some of them come with aspergillosis okay. the only thing we say is your immune system is down that's what has caused it not that you are your house is unhygienic or anything but that was one of this postulated theories that could it be related to the environment poor hygiene practice or or farmer but there are no farmers in this country so so we had to think about alternative causes yeah. so that could be one of the reasons i think but uh, it's difficult to prove okay there's one question which says what is the duration of protection from two doses of covi shield uh, i answered to him i think <laughs> that said, is uh, the the siren study is looking at it yeah. we are we, we currently know that at the end of 5 months 86% are still protected we will continue to track it when information is available then the siren study investigators will release the information saying that covid shield vaccine will sustain immunity levels adequate to thought of an infection up until 6 months 9 months or 12 months okay. and it is so much interesting that now already the uk government is thinking about offering boosters to the elderly in case the immunity it Be is found okay. that the immunity is dropping okay so i have one last question if i yeah. can ask Yeah. Uh, recently I had a call from the OBG department they mm. want to take up a trial study because there are a lot of newborn uh, babies and mothers who are actually coming out to be positive they are requesting if i could look into the uh, umbilical cord blood and uh, the uh, amniotic fluid for any positivity uh, are you looking at antibody or are you looking at white very I am doing both. I am trying to do both the antibody mm. assay and 
I, I told them without viremia, looking for viral transmission in the uh, through the placenta may not be very helpful. But she still says, why don't we? Because nobody has done it. And um, how will how will you interpret it? How will well, you know what is significant titer? If, if it is antibody, I if understand. If it's present, if it's antibody, antibody, if it's antibody, I understand. But if it is a viremia, viremia is not a part of the COVID. pathophysiology of COVID. Yes, it is. It is respiratory, isn't it? It is respiratory, but yeah, since it's so, affecting, I don't know. I was just wondering if no, if, if there could be a transmission that way. No, so no. it will not be. No, so it's 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 uh, it's. I think it's environment, hundred oh. percent. Yeah. 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 Uh, so thank you, thank you both yep. of you for that uh, uh, wonderful presentation. I think it's answered most of our questions on vaccines. And uh, I thank uh, Dr. Vasu and Dr. Ravi also to give me an opportunity to moderate the sessions. Thank you, thank you. Very thank much. you. Thank you all.